Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Beth Chalecki. Beth is a, an associate professor of international relations at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, and also a research fellow in the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the Wilson Center. Beth has done groundbreaking research on geoengineering and joins us to discuss her Wilson Center project. Beth, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, John, for having me. So. Uh, let, let me, the, the title of your, the working title of your project, Rethinking Sovereignty in the Change in a Changed Climate, the National Security Role of Common Based, Commons Based Geoengineering. See, I'm struggling through that because of the jargony nature. So for uh -huh. the lay person, can you translate what, that's, what that means? Yes, I can. Uh, we've all been seeing on the news what's happening now with climate change. And this isn't just recent, this has been piling up for a number of years, but we're seeing now about some of the damage that we're causing with continued greenhouse gas emissions and hearing from scientists what kind of world we're gonna be facing at the end of the 21st century if we don't do something about it. So we've tried mitigation options, which basically means cutting greenhouse gas emissions. Nations haven't been very good at it. They haven't done it, including, I'm sorry to say, the United States. And then we tried adaptation, and that basically means trying to adapt to this changing climate, to the floods, the droughts, the heat waves, the pandemics, and so on. We're not very good at this either. Well, we have a technological third option, and it's broadly called geoengineering. And what this is, is climate manipulation technologies that we can use to alter the climate to offset the worst parts of climate change. So it sounds like it might be a technological fix, but of course it's not that simple. I want to obviously dive into that a bit, but but before doing that, I want to start with sort of a, a bottom line question, and then we can fill in as we go forward. But it, based on everything you know, uh, are we almost too late to the game? Almost. That's the operative word. We're not quite too late yet. I don't want to give anybody a, a sense of fatalism or despair. There's absolutely things we can do to help turn this scary climate trajectory around, but we really can't waste any more time with this. And this gets to part of the, what I think you called was the jargony word, uh, sovereignty in the title of the project. We, in the international system, we think of sovereign states as indivisible and separate. So anything that happens in one state doesn't affect anything that happens in any other state and they can all mind their own business. But you can't do that with the environment. So if my country is emitting greenhouse gases, then what I'm gonna be doing is affecting your climate even though you're halfway around the world from me. So we have to rethink this international order but it is definitely not too late. We just have to do it. And if anyone needed to be reminded of that in stark terms, the pandemic certainly is evidence that viruses like temperatures don't observe borders the way we do when we look at maps. They do not stop to get their passport stamped. They just come yeah. in. So, so given all of these uh, uh, variables and all of the barriers to the kind of cooperation that it takes to achieve the types of goals that are necessary so that we can take that almost and move it into a, a more positive category, do you see the potential for that in a realistic way? The cooperation necessary? Yes, I think so. And I think the key part of this is what we're seeing now under the current administration. We need to have our own federal administration stand up and say the United States will shoulder its part of the responsibility because we can't pretend that this isn't happening to us. We can't pretend that we're not helping cause this. And it certainly isn't a hoax invented by China. This is an actual physical process that we're driving, all the countries in the world are driving with greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we can work together to do it, but the United States needs to step up and admit that it has to take on a leadership role and it will in fact do that. I'm looking forward to that in the future. Can you put a timeline on your sense of urgency? I know I had the benefit of seeing an internal presentation you did for your colleagues, where you had some graphics maps that showed temperature rises, and they were all shades of either orange or red. There wasn't anything that looked cool. Uh, so what are we talking about in terms of how much time we have? The graphics I showed you were looking at changes in temperature in the Earth's surface from the end of last century to the end of this century. And by the end, maybe 2080, which is not that far away when you think about it, you and I might not love to see it, but our children and grandchildren definitely will. The Earth is looking to be at least three or four degrees centigrade warmer than it is now. And that's a huge ecosystem shock all around the world from the North Pole down to the equator, down to the South Pole. This is gonna affect security in all kinds of ways which is why geoengineering is looking to governments like an attractive option. 
Okay, so so given all the things we've been talking about, let's let's dig in a bit on the types of geoengineering that you're describing. First of all, are we talking about speculative or possible technologies, or are we talking about things that are actually being developed or perhaps even tested as we speak? Well, both, as a matter of fact. The term geoengineering is a big umbrella term, and it encompasses a lot of different kinds of technologies. But there's two main ways we might geoengineer the Earth's climate. On the one hand, it's called solar radiation management. And this is basically bouncing sunlight back out of the atmosphere before it has a chance to reach the ground. That's one method, and there's various ways to do this. The other main method is called carbon dioxide removal, and it's basically sucking CO2 and other, and other greenhouse gases directly out of the atmosphere and sequestering them somewhere. Now, we have operations, we have experiments, I should say, rather, in both of these types uh, in different ways, but I think there's some significant differences between these two types. Solar radiation management is fast, cheap, and dangerous, and carbon dioxide is slow, safe, and effective, but we don't know how much time we have, so the fast option is going to look more attractive. What is the danger element? Well, the danger element here is that if we don't use the time that we're giving ourselves by bouncing sunlight out of the atmosphere, if we don't use that time to continue to remove greenhouse gases or to cease emitting them in the first place, or at least slow down emitting them in the first place, if you stop this solar radiation management method, then what happens is CO2 and other greenhouse gases have continued to build up in the atmosphere. And when the sunlight comes back, you see a sudden spike in temperature. It's known as termination shock. And that is a real problem because there's no way to mitigate that level of that level of change. We would not be able to adapt easily to that level of change. It would happen so fast. And how does the slower, safer option work? The slower, safer option works by sucking CO2. And I use this term sucking. There's different ways to do it chemically. But basically, it's just removing CO2 out of the atmosphere directly and sequestering it either underground or in some kind of container or some other method. Um, it's slower because of the resonance time of CO2 in the atmosphere, it takes a long time to remove it. And so as a result, um, it's safer. We're not tinkering with the ecosystem. But on the other hand, it's going to take decades to work, whereas some of the SRM measures could work potentially in weeks. And where are these experiments taking place and how close are any nations to actually applying these methods? Uh, I can answer that last one for you right now. No nation is close to applying this right now. These are okay. just a test of concept. Um, but I think if some of them are successful, one experiment turns into dozens, which could potentially turn into hundreds. So uh, we have seen a successful experiment off the coast of Australia, protecting, trying to protect the Great Barrier Reef. It's being bleached right now because the ocean is being coming more acidic and more hot. And so they're losing one of their greatest natural attractions. In fact, it's one of the greatest natural wonders of the world, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, if you haven't seen it, I would suggest seeing it soon. And they did a small test of brightening the clouds over the reef in order to cool the temperature, and it worked. Uh, it was a small test, but it was proof of concept. Uh, we have seen a couple of other tests of dumping iron filings into the ocean to try to stimulate plankton growth, which sequester carbon when they die. It was a small test. It was kind of inconclusive. So more tests there are needed. And there was a test planned for the stratospheric aerosol injection, which is another method of bouncing sunlight out that was just canceled. It was supposed to take place over Sweden later this year. Uh, and apparently protests from the indigenous peoples of Sweden and the north area there, um, apparently that pressured the government to cancel it. So right now we're still waiting on proof of concept for that experiment. So if, if I understand everything, and this is a lot to, to digest, but if I understand what you're saying, uh, we can't put all of our eggs in any one basket. And we certainly can't just rely on technology to save us. We're going to have to do some things in the interim before these technologies are up and running. I think so, too. And this is where we really need to make sure that we have our governments in line working together to try to lower the greenhouse gas emissions that, that the current world is currently putting out. Unfortunately, with the global economy coming out of the pandemic, coming out of this pandemic induced slowdown, uh, we are gonna see greenhouse gas emissions increasing. And we need to take seriously this responsibility that all nations of the world have to work together and to not end up with a huge temperature increase for future generations. Beth, I know earlier you said you don't want to scare people with these projections, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to several years ago, I, I heard uh, Michael Crichton uh, 
do a presentation, you know, he of uh, Jurassic Park fame. Yes. And, uh, and, and of course, the, the, that it itself is a cautionary tale about trying to manipulate science and not uh, checking all the boxes of what you might anticipate. And essentially, in the presentation that I saw, he spoke about the types of geoengineering that you're talking about. And he talked about the unintended consequences. And his suggestion was that humans are really bad at anticipating those. So I wonder, as you delve into all of these potential options, uh, where your hopes or where your deepest concerns lie, and do you have do you have faith that we can find a way to pull this off? My hope is that we can finally realize that economic development and prosperity and environmental protection and preservation don't work against one another. If we do the economy right, they work with each other. As we get richer, we preserve the environment, and as we preserve the environment, we get richer. Right now, we have this world economic model set up so that the two are fighting one another. So you can't make economic gains without environmental losses and vice versa. My hope is that we realize that doesn't have to be true, and it's up to us to change it. So rather than, rather than go right to the so-called technological fix, my concern and my hope is that we realize that we have a moral obligation to protect the environment. This is what gives us life. We've kind of forgotten that. We've kind of forgotten we rely on the environment for everything. And we think we can live without the environment, which is nonsense. I think if we really realize this, then you know, all kinds of policy options are possible without having to resort to technology that he was right. We're not good at anticipating the, the effects of. And I think it would be arrogant of us to try. Speaking of arrogance, people often speak about this as if what we're destroying is the earth, but in reality, what we're destroying is the human ecosystem to support human life on the earth. We're destroying the biosphere, yes. Yeah. We're not destroying the planet, no, but we're destroying the ecosystem on the planet that allows us to live and thrive. It's <laughs> the, like the, sawing off the, our own tree branch. Yeah, wow. Uh, so another aspect of this, another thing that you're expert in is in the national security issues related to these issues. Can these technologies be weaponized? That's a difficult question. At this point, none of them are far enough along to even be considered. But the idea is there that perhaps we might want to manipulate the weather um, in conflict in some way or in, or in combat in some way. We've tried this in the past uh, with varying success. And there's been a treaty signed in 1977 called the Environmental Modification Convention, of which we're a party, the United States, to say we won't do that in a hostile manner. But it doesn't say anything about using environmental modification techniques for research purposes. So could these be used for research purposes and actually have another intent altogether? Potentially, yes. But I don't think we could think about weapons. Weapons we normally think of as things that go bang, as kinetic weapons somehow. That's not what this kind of weapon would be. This would mm -hmm. be something where a nation might materially alter the living conditions or the weather of another nation with a geopolitical intent in mind. So create a drought. Perhaps. Is this, a, is this a concern or are we far out now uh, in, when we're looking at this prioritizing what we should be focused on or worried about? I think this is pretty far out. But the reason that I wanted to come to the Wilson Center to look at this was because, again, we're bad at anticipating this sort of thing. I think right. it's far out, but it might not be far out two or three years from now. So I wanted to work on this project. So in case we did run into this situation, any policymakers who wanted to learn about it could draw on my report to do so. So Beth, who is the audience for your work? And, and what I'm thinking of, who are the people who are laser-like focused on these potentialities and who are, who are working on them? Well, there's a, a number of scientists across various universities, governments, and think tanks around the world that are working on the scientific aspect of geoengineering just to see if the concepts work. Uh, these are the people that are designing and planning these experiments and they're collaborating on them. So there's an international group of scientists working on it right now. What they are not thinking of, to the best of my knowledge, is the international relations and security aspect of these technologies. Uh, there might be um, some audience for that in the Intel community, I'm not certain, but this is something that I think defense and security planners are going to have to look at and decide concretely whether or not they want to pursue this. And, and as we discussed at the outset of our, of our interview, uh, this isn't something that one nation can pay attention to. This is going to be a collaborative effort. Is there a model for this level of cooperation that you could recommend? The only model that we have right now is the United Nations. This is the only place where planet altering technologies, which is quite literally what this is, 
is going to be vetted and be allowed to be aired out by the entire international community. Now, there are some models that we might use to draw up a new convention or agreement, but in my mind, I think the one that we need to pay attention to, the one that almost worked and failed at the last minute, was the Baruch Plan of 1946. And that was the one chance that we had to put atomic weapons, which was planet changing technology at the time, under international control. We clung to this territorial notion of sovereignty. And so this failed in the UN, the brand new United Nations, and we, we couldn't do it. We missed the chance and it was a pivotal moment in history. We ended up with a nuclear arms race. My concern is that by letting each nation pursue geoengineering individually, we might very well end up with a climate arms race. What are the lessons of the Baruch plan is in terms of how we might get over the hump this time and not let it fall apart? Well, I think we have to consider whether or not we cling to this idea of territorial sovereignty. In most areas of international law, like trade or human rights, or even security to some extent, sovereignty serves us fine, but not in the environment. There's no such thing as an environmentally sovereign nation. You can't make your air or space above you your own atmosphere. The whole planet is connected ecologically. And so if we can make that realization, we might be able to cede some sovereignty to this international organization with regard to this particular technology. I'm not calling for the UN to become a world government or to take over the sovereignty of every nation, but every nation's gonna have to realize that they're connected in a way that they haven't been before. They've always been connected, but they haven't realized it before. So ultimately, where do we go from here? I, I, when I'm, what I'm hearing, at least the word that we haven't spoken explicitly yet, perhaps, is leadership, that a, a necessity for leadership, someone to step up to rally the troops, the nations in this case, and to really put this front and center on the agenda. Uh, what, what do you see out there? Do you see potential for that? Well, with regard to climate change, I think the United States could be the leader. We just have to do it. We can't have this whipsawing back and forth between Republican and Democratic administrations as to whether or not we will stand with the rest of the world in trying to combat this global problem. If we can do that, if the United States can regain its leadership, then I think we're, we're gonna make some progress here. Um, if we don't, then we leave it to other nations. But in terms of the geo, developing a geoengineering regime specifically, I'm not sure the United States has a lot of credibility in this regard because we have been, again, such a bad climate player in the recent past. I think it's gonna fall to the middle powers, powers like Canada. I really think that they have the potential to uh, set up an excellent regime and they have the international soft power to be able to sell other nations on the necessity of joining any kind of international agreement to govern global commons-based geoengineering. Well, Beth, this is all fascinating and uh, important work. So thank you for your time today and thank you for your ongoing efforts. Absolutely, John, it's been my pleasure. Mine as well. That's Beth Chalecki. If you'd like to see more of her work, come to wilsoncenter.org and you can find Beth under the Environmental Change and Security Program. Beth, thanks again. And thanks to our viewers as well. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.